for another edition of Office Hours. Here we're joined with Arash Markazi, a columnist at the LA Times, and an LA native who just can't seem to get away from the traffic. Appreciate you. Appreciate you joining us. And I know you wrote that this was a golden age of LA sports. Is this a golden age of Arash Markazi? Oh, wow. I hope so. I have no <laughs> idea. But I think it's it's been a fun time to be in Los Angeles. I think we have... Uh, Two teams in every sport. We're about to kind of go into this run here where the Super Bowl is going to come to town, the um, the Olympics, World Cup. I mean, so so many big events that were here before that we didn't have here for quite some time are now going to come back. So I think if you're a sports fan in Los Angeles, it's a fantastic time. And for you, coming back not home, but like yeah. coming back to a place that you've considered a dream job and after stops at SI and ESPN and now back at the Times. As you look back on both your career personally and professionally, what was this like opportunity when when you decided to make that jump? You know, the Times was always a dream job for me. Like when I was growing up in Los Angeles, I read Jim Murray. And so the idea of getting to do that, the idea of getting to be a sports columnist at the Los Angeles Times was such a dream. But it was a dream that quite frankly, by 2019, I mean, I, I I didn't think it was still something that I could do, mainly because I had moved on and the Times was owned by the Tribune Company. And, you know, it didn't seem like a great place. But when Dr. Patrick Sunshiang pur- purchased the paper and wanted to do certain things and cover new things, I mean, it really changed my view. So when we had a conversation, um, I I was like, you know, that's a guy that I would love to work for and that's a paper that obviously I would love to work for. Um, so, um, and also, you know, it, it was a great time to, to come back in terms of like Los Angeles sports, as I talked about. Yeah. It's just, you know, there's so, there's so much happening here. Um, and the re- really cool thing was my first day on the job, I'm flying to Atlanta, like literally first day on the job for the Super Bowl. And I'm like, this is tough life, huh? This is like a dream. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, first day on, on my job after the investment, I think I was flying to LA. <laughs> so, uh, so the reverse track, obviously from, from New York and, and now you've been here going on almost a year, right? I yeah. I, I joined uh, January. So I mean, I, like January 1st was when I first took the job or accepted it. And yeah. then, um, January 20th, I think was like my beginning, but yeah, it's almost. And been everything that you've expected. Yeah. I mean, and, and even surpassed expectation in terms of, you know, it is a paper that allows you to express yourself and write about what you want to write about. And even if there are things that I, I touch on that are, are really local and maybe not that many people care about, um, they provide me the opportunity to say, no, listen, that this is, this is your voice, your column. And so, I mean, I, it's been such a dream. I, I get to write every Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. And so it's sort of like, I, I have an idea of what I want to um, hit on. Yeah. And, and has that been like the opportunity that you expected it to be? I'm assuming, right? Like yeah. to be, and I know, I know you tweeted about having your, your photo yeah. on, and the, and the pixel odds. And like, that's probably just like something when you come back and think like, I grew up reading this now I'm reading myself. Yeah. I mean, so I, I did a column, um, recently where, Bill Plaschke came to our high school to ask us what it's like to be in Los Angeles without a pro football team. Almost to the day of that column, I did, did a column basically explaining why Los Angeles doesn't have hardcore pro football fans. I said, well, they, they don't because they didn't have a team here for 21 years. Yeah. But so I, I, I did a picture of that column because obviously like when my, that was my first time I saw my name, I'm in the p- paper. So I bought, I don't know, six copies of that and <laughs> highlighted it, highlighted it. And it. So that's me. Yeah. Um, but then I did a picture of that and then I did a picture of m- my column. And it, was, it kind of hit me at that moment because back in 97, you know, that was my dream job. And so to have that job and to get to write about growing up in a Los Angeles that didn't have pro football. I mean, it was such a cool thing. And from the business standpoint, I think that's one of the biggest stories in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. right? You have the two football teams coming back. You wrote in, in that column, right? The league neglected a generation of fans before finally returning to LA. They went to places like Mexico and yeah. London without coming to LA in terms of everything. And we, we saw, right, what happened with the Steelers yeah. and the Chargers at that game. Like, is there a market for two? NFL teams you think here long term or is it something that like could potentially down the line be something where it's we're seeing another relocation yeah I mean I think it could handle too 
I don't think one of the two should be the Chargers. I think everyone in Los Angeles views them as San Diego's team. It'd be the same if the Padres came up here. It's it's no knock on the Chargers, but we don't believe that they are Los Angeles' team. Yeah. And so that's that's going to be hard for them. Whereas the Rams have a history here. They have a 50-year history here. Um, the Chargers are just viewed for 56 years. They were in San Diego. When you think of San Diego, you think of SeaWorld, you think of the Padres, you think of the Chargers. So that one's going to be tough for them. Um, so I, I do believe it could support two, but I don't think one of the two could or should be the Chargers. And I think, too, that comes back to this. And, and you're, a, I wouldn't say a Vegas resident, but you, you like, there you're, you're, yeah. there, you're there a lot, right? One yeah. of the success stories recently in Las Vegas is the Golden Knights, yeah. but they were a team that was born there born, right? yeah. you know what i mean Los lafc was born mm. here do you do you think that you're probably going to see instead of more relocation you're going to see more of like being born because like that's where you can yeah and the other thing is like the, those are two leagues that there are i mean just talking to people um they didn't have a hockey team yeah like a las vegas sports fan probably had a pro football team they had like an nba team or, or whatnot but they they kind of were new to hockey so like i'm like well i wasn't a hockey fan before this is my team same with soccer which was a little bit surprising to me here but i mean there were so many fans of the team that were not soccer fans before so the problem with football is that at some point in your life if you're you know 15 20 you know you have a team so it's hard to, for example, for the past 21 years when we didn't have a team and you were, say, a Cowboys fan, like you're not going to all of a sudden be a Rams or Chargers fan. Um, but you're 100% right. I, I think it would have had more success or been a quicker acceptance if they were born in los angeles and you have a team being born in los angeles it's the xfl team right the, that's right the, the, wildcats, the wildcats right what do you think you know as, even just as an onlooker is going to happen with something like the xfl do you think there is a market here for spring football is it going to be another aaf i wouldn't say fiasco but another yeah. aaf thing where it's a year and, and gone you know I, I don't only because of the kind of um, infrastructure that they have in place. I do like what they've done in terms of, first of all, that it should not be in a big Coliseum or Rose Bowl or something. So the 27,000 seat venue, I think, is perfect. The ticket prices are fantastic. You could get season tickets for $100, and I think that's including a field pass for a game. So that's a way that if you're a family of four or if you're like a college student or, or whatnot and you want a cheap alternative to the pro football, you know, with the Rams being extremely expensive and the Chargers. The Chargers, I, I think, have a possible route to success with their cheap or um, inexpensive tickets. So $50 per game season ticket. I think that's where you can get casual fans becoming season ticket holders, and then maybe you can hopefully get that casual fan to be a hardcore fan at some point. Again, it's going to take time, though. Do you see the same thing happening potentially in Las Vegas where you had the situation in here in L.A. at Dignity Health Sports Park with the Chargers where theoretically – most of the people were, I wouldn't say away fans, sure. but fans for the other team, no. right? It's going to become a destination almost, right? There's no doubt about it. I mean, they, this is something that I think when they first were talking about Las Vegas, I thought about because, I, you know, if you're a, a fan of, let's say, the Chiefs or the Broncos or whatnot, and you go to one road game per year, you're going to go to Vegas. You're, 100%. You're going to fly in Friday night. You're going to enjoy yourself Friday, Saturday go to the game Sunday and then um, head back home. And um, so that's that's going to be a problem for them. They have a fit fan base. They have a hardcore fan base. But most fans, if they can, recoup their entire season ticket. Because, like, listen, what Charger fans apparently pretty much did this year, they recouped their season tickets off of selling the Steelers game and the Packers game. And it's smart. And I know people are, are, are upset who are Chargers fans saying that's, looks terrible but listen if if i can recoup all of my season ticket what i paid for it off of two games i have to do that and the economics exactly. right? and the market is just it's hard not to do yeah. it in terms of both you know cost and opportunity and i think the other big conversation specifically here is as you get into the lead up of the olympics and then a lot of these other things that are going on here but fast forward to like potentially 2023 now with the nil and what's going around college yeah. athletics and What's kind of like the general consensus in California? Someone who's you know probably pretty plugged in in terms of the athletic standpoint of like what's going to happen, what people are preparing for, 
what do you think is going to happen to like a USC or yeah. your alma mater? I mean, here's the thing. I, I think, because I think when, when people talk about this, they don't realize that this is just giving the player the opportunity yep. to make something off of, if you're going to sell my jersey, if you're going to uh, sell a poster with my picture on it, I should make some money off of my likeness. And so where that may help a USC, for example, is that if you're a Heisman Trophy candidate player, and now you can, you know, do stuff in Hollywood. That that that's massive. That that's huge. So, I like it. I think it's fantastic. I think it's ridiculous for these schools to profit off of the likeness of a player, and for the player not to at least profit something off of it. But to your point, I think that's that's where it'll help a, a, a team in Los Angeles, for example, because it's like now all of a sudden you you can maybe do a commercial and do things like that on the side and, and have almost a bigger impact yeah. you know, than somewhere else. But um, yeah, it's 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 changing, and that's you know I think one of the big things going on in sports right now is you have this intersection of sports and everything, right? Like as much as some people don't want to admit that sports and politics is completely intertwined, you look at both what the NIL is doing, right? I mean that's a platform for some people's mm. presidential you know there are people who are out there running on presidential opportunities with the nil in mind and then you have the stuff that happened with in, in the nba in china and i know you wrote on that as well right like how do you kind of like balance what i think sports has become and, and over like the time that you've probably been even involved with it the china thing was incredible because i was there during the whole ucla shoplifting incident and yeah. you know and which i i never expected that obviously and so that kind of changed the way that i covered that but it was like it is a scary place when you do something wrong or you say something wrong in a country like that and so i, I mean i i kind of thought back to that moment when this whole thing was happening over there um but um yeah, listen, I mean, it it, it goes two ways, right? Because LeBron, for the majority of his time as this person who's used his platform for good, it, it it's usually worked out for him. And I think with the China, there was this feeling of, okay, so you're more about selling shoes than you are about standing up for something that's right. So it's a d delicate... Uh, thing because you know i think lebron wants to comment when he's asked about these things but i think in, in respect to what he said about china and the uh, tweet like i i just thought like that wasn't a, that wasn't the right thing to say it wasn't a good look for him and so and i think he he even was surprised by it because i mean he said what he truly believed but um it just wasn't good do you think it would have been different and i asked someone else this too do you think it would have been different if it was another team another league you know obviously the nba and, and what they've become known for in the u.s is their forward thinking their progressiveness sure. on a lot of social issues and now there's almost a chance for people i wouldn't say to take a take a swipe but sure. kind of like do you think it would i would i mean i probably think it would have been different if it was an mlb or an nhl well or, it just doesn't carry the same weight yeah. i mean this this is important and this is when we're talking about it because it's lebron james and then you combine that with now it's like lebron james and the, the los angeles lakers and it's just like this like you can't have a bigger platform you know than that uh so um, yeah, listen, I, I, I don't think it makes news if it's someone else, but it is LeBron James and he's a big d deal and, and people, so pe people want to know if he says something about Trump, right? And so they, they also want to hear from him if, if he comments about China or, you know, freedom of speech and things like that. Yeah. And I think another thing that you mentioned in one of your columns recently was that you have LA's third most interesting basketball <laughs> yeah. team, right? Which is Sierra Canyon, yeah. you know, where LeBron's son is playing, D Wade's son is playing. I mean, the fact that you were even there at high school media days, it says something yeah, a lot about exactly. what's about what's going on and like the interest. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they had a media day was crazy, right? But it's 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 one of those things where it's a school that I think everyone's going to talk about and probably cover this season, and so. Um, you know, they, they speaking of China, they had a 12 day preseason trip to China. They're going to be playing in nine different states, I think. And they put their kids through like media training sessions. I mean, you, you just look at LeBron's son and D Dwayne Wade's son combined five million um, Instagram followers. So, I mean, there's there's this pull and reach that they have. So, um Listen, we've covered high school sports for years. That's not new, but this is sort of like the uh, this is sort of the uh, combination of uh, 
high school sports, but also like pop culture and celebrity. And, and because you, you, you know, for a fact that LeBron and Dwayne are going to go to a lot of their games. So yeah, absolutely. And as I think as part of the evolution of the LA sports scene also comes with your personal evolution too. And, and everything that, that you've been through and that you've done as personally and then even most recently what is that you know as you look back on and, and you probably still have more things that you want to do but like what's that kind of like journey been like up until this point yeah it was, it was amazing it was last september i was traveling and i and i you know couldn't get like the seatbelt to fit and it was one of those things where i'm like oh man this is this is not good and, and listen i you when you're that big and i was 329 you get to a point where you're just not you don't care and it's like to even begin the process is just going to take forever but i realized at that point you know I, I was having a hard time getting into like the seat on the plane and obviously with the whole seat belt so i, I just began um the journey and it was just like okay i'm, I'm gonna start every day i'm gonna do something active you know 60 minutes half hour whatever cardio trying to stay under like 1600 calories just trying to take care of myself and the consistency of that and doing that for a year i mean i've lost 130 pounds over the wow. past year so and the cool thing is like i made myself publicly accountable i put it online i put it on on social media just to kind of let people know that um, this is what I'm about, uh, this is what I'm about to do. And so if I fail, you are going to tell me about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I just thought it was so cool at the beginning, so many people encouraging me and helping me along the way. And then, um, you know, I ran into Kobe and he's like, man, you look great. Or you, you go and talk to someone else and they're like, oh, you know, they, you know, those words of encouragement are, are big. And really the biggest thing for me also was just the number of people who've talked to me about they began their journey because they, they saw me. And then, I, so I never expected that. And I put it out there to make myself accountable. So the fact that so many people have kind of joined me on this journey has been so cool. And still continues. Yeah. Right? And, and now it's like a lifestyle. Now yeah. it's like, you know, it, it's something that I did for a year, but it's not like I'm going to go back to doing what I did before. I think, you know, I feel good now. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I mean, and, and it's something that I, I'm still trying to figure out because like I, I've never been a big um, health and fitness guy. And now people are talking to me about, do you have any advice? Do you have any tips? And it's like surreal because like a year ago, like that wasn't my thing. And so now I'm, I'm trying to figure out or try to find ways where I can do more and um, help people. Are we going to see a Rosh Markazi on Peloton? I don't are you know. Are going to be a, a guest instructor? Maybe. You something know? fun. I mean, yeah, you know? Cool. Yeah. Well, you got a sandwich already. That's right. right. You, might as well. you know, and the funny thing about the sandwich was like I created it prior to my fitness journey and so even now i can't even have it because it's like this like fried chicken coleslaw wasabi mayo cheddar cheese and i'm like oh geez <laughs> it, it's fantastic but i yeah. can't i can't have it it's a it's a good indicator of maybe even how far you've come right? yeah, it's just like it's, it's something that's that's there and, and i think talking about how far you come and, and how far everything's come what is at least in your opinion the sports landscape of la changed in, in the time that you've lived here which is your entire life and is, is it for for better, for worse, and different? Like, you know, you now have 11 professional sports right. teams or something like that here. You have all the colleges. You have everything going on. Is is now, like, the best time of L.A. sports, at least in your opinion? I think so. I mean, listen, they, they have to win now. But yeah. in terms of all the teams being here, all the teams are competitive. I think it's a fantastic time. And, and um, it is a city that I think has a clear number one team and then a clear number two team. But for the most part... Um, all the teams draw well, obviously in the Chargers case, like they need to draw their own fans or cultivate their own fans. But it's a fantastic time in Los Angeles sports. I mean, you kind of like wake up one morning and then it's like, um, you know, what, what did we have recently? Like Joe Madden gets tired by the um, Angels and, uh, you know, like LeBron James controversy. I mean, I mean, if you just focus on Los Angeles sports, Sports, there's so much. So, getting to cover this scene at this period of time has been f f f has been fantastic. And in terms of like, what do you think is, is next, or what do you like? You see LA now, and like what it can become from a sports standpoint. As you're talking about the Olympics and you know World Cup and college football playoff, national championship, Super Bowl, all these things that are that are coming to LA. Obviously, that means pretty much a guaranteed job for you for the next ten <laughs> yeah. years, right? Um, but also, like from just an, an infrastructure standpoint, just like in a city improvement, do you think that 
what's happening at a sports level is also going to trickle down to both like a, a city level and what's going on in LA just from overall. Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to see us improve, improve public transportation. Obviously when you have a hundred thousand seats stadium, that's going to hold Olympic events and world cup events and Super Bowl and things like that. You want the, the ability to not have to drive there to take public tra- public transportation so that that would be fantastic when you look at staples center for example downtown was a place that nobody wanted to go to nobody wanted to hang out but after they built that the number of uh you know lofts and homes and shops and restaurants i mean so it it, it's really improved so but public transportation would would be fantastic you know whenever i go to new york or chicago or someplace like that i'm like i wish we had a thing like this and you probably uh, would have more people who live here exactly right. so like you know thank goodness for like uh, uber and lyft and things like that but it would be nice to have a little bit of a subway or train or something like that maybe a hyperloop elon exactly. musk coming <laughs> that <here>. would be good <laughs> and, and and you know you you hear and you've seen the stuff about the new venue potentially for inglewood and what the clippers want to do and do you think like at the end of the day it's it makes sense to have a long-term success with all these teams and all these different venues like is it to the point where la may have like too many sports teams like do you think that it'll ever get to that point yeah. or like is it that point now no you know i i think it's a little bit like new york in terms of there's enough population to support two teams where it becomes a problem if um you know the the problem for the chargers for example that we we touched about is that they are not um they are viewed as San Diego's team. So as long as there is a connection to Los Angeles, and I know the Chargers are trying to do that, I think the team can be successful. And there is enough fans to to support the Lakers and the Clippers and the Kings and the Ducks and the Angels and the Dodgers and things like that. So (laughs) you go down the list, and I just touched on a little bit. But I think there's enough. But where it becomes a problem is if, obviously, if the team's not winning. And we said about that about Los Angeles for years. If you win, they'll support you. If you don't, they won't. And I know people view that as, like, that means you're a fair-weather fan. It's a marketplace that that says, listen, there's so much to do here that if the product's not good, I'm not going to spend my time, my money to support it. And I and I actually think that that's great because it forces the teams to make moves and to make hires to win. Because there's a lot of markets that people are going to sell out regardless. And I know teams generally want to win, right? But like, if I'm going to sell out regardless of what I do you know, maybe I don't make a certain trade or maybe I don't make a certain hire or maybe I don't pay for a certain player. But in Los Angeles, you cannot do that. If you're the Clippers, you got to get Kawhi and you got to get Paul George and you got to, you know, you have to compete. Yeah. And one of the other big events that's coming is right. The the Super Bowl. And, yeah. and obviously out beyond that is the, the Olympics and the potential of that. And, you know, I would say the U.S. is a little bit different from an Olympic standpoint. We're not really, the infrastructure is here, yeah. right? So do you think if, when the Olympics come and, and as they're coming, right, do you think at post-Olympics there's going to be a similar, like, letdown or something like that where, you know, everyone gets hyped up about it, sure. but usually all these countries are like, well, why did we host the Olympics, know. you know, in the first place? But to your point, I, I think it, it'll be fantastic in the sense that there's no venue being built that's going to be used as a p- parking lot or something. Yeah. I mean, I, and we've seen those depressing pictures of they build something and like it's not used. Every facility that we have for all the pro sports teams that we touched on, like they will be used. So once the Olympics are done, there will be a letdown because I think everyone's going to be looking forward to 2028, I believe. And then, but once it's done, it's not like they're going to demolish the venue and they're going to be used. And I think that's that should be the model moving forward having it in cities that have these venues and can host it right now. It's like the Super Bowl model, right? Exactly. You know you I mean? You go to these places that it, I don't think anyone would be mad if the Olympics rotated between, I don't know, you know, London, Paris, and like LA, right? Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think people would, I don't think people yeah. would be upset about that. And for you, who's been in LA for such a long time and has explored the city from both a sports standpoint and a business standpoint, 
what do you kind of see like shaking out over the next few years on on both like the team side and the media side and there's all these things that like could potentially play into the factor of long-term success and health in, in this market yeah I, I think um team centric coverage has been really big um especially if you're a team that um is not getting a lot of coverage having your own uh, podcast network, having your own YouTube channel, having so- social media kind of cover you the way that you'd like to be covered. I know I, with the Times, for example, we can't cover um, every team the way that we would like to. So if you're one of those teams that's not being c- covered the way that you would l- like it to be covered, there are so many opportunities to connect with your fans through podcast, YouTube, Twitch, whatnot. So I think that that's big. Um the Clippers will be like an interesting example of that because I think they want to do a lot of that. And Steve Ballmer wants to get very creative with that. And sports gambling, by the way, I would yeah. love to see that. I mean, you go to the new stadium site, SoFi, uh, there is a Hollywood Park casino right there. And they are ready to go. Whenever sports gambling is legal, that that's, the, I mean, they are pre- prepared uh, for that moment. So the idea of going to a sports book, placing a bet, walking to the game, and then if you win, you get to walk back and c- collect. That's huge. It's, I mean, potentially what you have the opportunity to do in, in Vegas, right? Exactly. And I can currently yeah. do it. And you really can do it in New Jersey right now. Yeah. So, like, I, I mean, but... Vegas will be surreal too because uh, just them having a pro football team after years and years and years of not having sports, hockey, women's hoops, football. It's I mean that's a fun time period too. And, and there's a another I think passion point of yours is women's hoops and the yeah. WNBA and, and the coverage of that and you know how does the I wouldn't say like how does it grow but like what's that next step for the WNBA at least in your opinion from who people you've talked to and things like that obviously they got the first commissioner with Kathy and are now trying to take steps to to really grow that league you know I would say with purpose right not just like to do it you know the coverage is big um, but because you kind of connect with teams that you know or you connect with players that you know and so for them to kind of tell the story of players I think is big and for you know the games need to be on broadcast television more you know i think a lot of the games are so hard to find um and i I, and i really didn't like what they did with these sparks i mean they were playing a playoff game at a long beach college it's like you listen if you're gonna have the the, the, this league you you have to treat the players and teams like you would um like any other pro sports league so it's it's something that I would love to see happen. I've done coverage. I would like to do more of it, but it's 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 one of those things where it's like, you know, uh, whenever there's a game on TV, I, I stop and I watch, and I, and it's fantastic. So and it's and it's an affordable ticket. I think yeah. that goes to another point of, of it being a family friendly league. So, um, you know, I, I've told people like the best deal in the city is a $6 suite ticket. They have these suites at Staples Center. And for $6, you can go into a suite and watch the team play. Yeah, I, I went to my first WNBA game uh, this year, the Liberty. And honestly, like, I, I grew up in a market in Phoenix in Arizona yeah. that had the Mercury. I just never went as sure. a kid and my parents never took me. Uh, but I mean, for all the people that bash it as like not good basketball, it's, no, it's pretty darn good basketball, yeah. right? Like, and, and it's something that like, I wouldn't say like basketball with dunks is like the way it's not supposed yeah. to be played, but it's definitely pure fundamental basketball. Yeah. I, I, I had a good time. And right? here's the thing, just like it hit any league, there are bad teams, bad players, but bad games. So like, I'm not saying that this is like 100% of the time great, yeah. but the majority of times I've taken people to games, they've had a great time. And I think that's the end of the day is, is what it mm-hmm. what it needs to be anyways. And so as you look forward, I guess, over the course of the next 10 years, like what do you see? And we have all this stuff coming into L.A. Like what is going to be, I wouldn't say, like the defining moment? Well, what are those defining moments in like L.A.? Is it if the Lakers win a championship? Is it, you know, if, the, you know, Inglewood adds to the stadium now? Or like how do you see this like playing out as much as you can? Championships are what kind of define the teams in Los Angeles. Yeah. So I think whenever the Lakers have won, those have been like great moments in the city and you got the car flags and you got the parades and stuff like that. So for the Lakers, that would be, a, you know, if they can win again, a fantastic moment for the city. The, the, the Dodgers have not won the World Series. And so that's been a, a kind of a point of contention because I think everyone thought, you know, when you win 106 games, that you're going to at least get to the World Series. 
series yeah. and finally win it for the first time in 31 years. But that hasn't happened. Um, it'll be interesting if the Clippers win because I covered them when they had Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, and that team, and they never got past the second round of the playoffs. So if this team with Kawhi and Paul George um, win, how do I mean? How does Los Angeles celebrate that? Are they fully embraced now? Because you know they've been here for thirty-five years. People forget that. But they've always been sort of like the number two team in town. And also, listen, like when Donald Sterling was in control, like they were not, they they were one of the worst run teams in sports. So yep. with Steve Ballmer in charge and 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 the, the talent that they've assembled, if they win a championship, how are they embraced? Do they have a parade? What, like what happens? I mean, I'm curious to see that. Do you think they are embraced and have a parade? I think so. I'd be curious, though, you know, like, do they think that they have enough fans to have a, a, a full on like legit parade? Because I think it would obviously be a really bad look if you won and you had a parade and like not that many people came, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I think they they would try to figure that out. Listen, if they won a championship, that that's sort of like the a big moment for them in terms of. Because if you win in Los Angeles, then you're kind of part of the fraternity of champions. Like, you know, if you look at Staples Center, like the Kings won two Stanley Cups and the Sparks have won and the Lakers have won. And so the Clippers have it. And so like that, that the joke of like Taylor Swift has more championship banners than they do. Like if they win, that would be a big step for them and kind of like becoming a part of the city. And like we've won two. And as part of your journey personally, you've you know stopped at SI, SLAM, AP, done it all theoretically from a media standpoint. Curious to get just both your, your take and, and the thought on the current state of, of sports media, you know, seeing what has happened to SI recently yeah. for, for better or worse, you know, depending on which side of the table you're on and um, the rise of something like The Athletic where you have, you know, cli- colleagues who are, who are covering yeah. teams specifically for it. Like, where do you where do you see it being? Where do you see it going? Where do you see it at? Yeah, I mean, I do think it's at a good place or at least an improving place. Um you know, I think anytime you have places where people can go work. So when they go to the athletic, I think that's like a fantastic opportunity for people to have a, a choice. Because, you know, we went through this period where there was a lot of cutbacks and people were getting let go and there was nowhere for them to work. And now with the athletic and some other uh, places, I think that is um, great. Um but it, you know we're 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 at this weird place where because of social media sometimes we don't know who's like actually that's their job as a reporter so i i get this happens um, every day where like so and so's reporting this trade and i and i look and it's the it's no knock on them but it's like a twitter of a fan or someone who does a blog and it's like no listen i mean if 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 it's coming from like a reputable source, that's one thing. But because of the rise of social media, I think there's a lot of people who have a platform now um, that, you know, I, I think there's there's some people who don't know the difference between like if the Times reports something and someone on Twitter does. Yeah. And speaking of social media, obviously, it's probably played a key role in, in what you've done. It wasn't when you first started, but yeah. now is as part of it. But for you and, and the rise of this, good, bad, and different from a career standpoint, personal standpoint, a little bit of both you know i love social media in in terms of it's it's the ability to kind of talk to fans talk to readers to connect with people so when i have a story you know it would be one thing if if it just posted online but the fact that i can like hear from people and say like oh i really like this or like i don't like this and i don't agree with you here and so um it it's been fantastic and and so i i think it's improved and really where it's improved my job is if i'm I got a game covering it and all of a sudden something happens on television or, or what, or, or, you know, there's a scene that I didn't see, but it's being talked about on, tw- on t- Twitter. It does shape how I cover that game, you know? Um, so I think it's been a good thing for sure. And is that something as you've taken back to, to USC going full circle now teaching, right? Yeah. Um, how, how has that been? How has it been to see, you know, almost, 
like yourself and almost your shoes again, right? Like you're talking to 17, 18 year old Arash, yeah. but in a different form. And it's, and it's different because I, I, I tell the class that I was probably one of the last to have a print journalism degree. Like it says print journalism. Yeah. And so now it's just now it's just journalism and so we we talk about how to do podcasts we talk about how to do streaming how to uh you know how to do social media i mean i mean you you have to it's, so it's not just about going to a game and doing a game report it's about actually being able to go on television go on the radio host a podcast host a tv show and things like that that stuff i did not do i was just a print college newspaper reporter and i regret you know i mean you know i when i graduated in 2004 that was sort of a time period where things were beginning to change but they hadn't changed yet and so i do regret not being able to do campus tv campus radio things like that so um now the kids of the future are totally in a better position of at least now when they go somewhere they know how to do a tv hit how to talk about their story, things like that. What have been over the, you said graduated, you know, 2004, so 15 years yeah. now out of USC, what have been kind of the seminal moments over the course of that, that career where it's like, you know, you spent time here and then you went somewhere else and it's just like, all right, now I'm, I'm getting to where I'm going. That's something that even, you know, everyone struggles with is like, yeah, I want to be at LA Times columnist, yeah. but I have no idea how I'm going to get there. And mm -hmm. was it, I mean, you'd mentioned it earlier, but like, what was that kind of like seminal moments along the way over the last 15 years? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the internship I had with Time Inc. in 2003 allowed me to kind of think like I could do this for a job, you know, because that was a year before I graduated and I wasn't really sure, you know, I mean, listen, I knew I, that's what I wanted to do, but that was the first time I, I'm like, listen, I, I could live in New York and work for a big company like like that so that that was big um you know i i think any time i've written a piece that is that has done well that that makes me feel good about myself and makes me feel like okay like this is you know I'm, I'm i'm doing this right i mean the thing i love about the times for example is that it gives me a platform to write three days a week and at espn i think towards the end i i it was like I only wrote when I had something to write. For example, like 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 there the, the would be weeks where I would not write, and it was mainly because there's so many people there. And so, if I wanted to write a LeBron James story, it's like you have to check with like six people first, you <laughs> yeah. know. And again, like we have people covering LeBron too, but I, I think there's more of an ability to kind of um, write and tell stories and. Um, but man, you know, the, 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 the move to the times was such a big moment for me, you know, cause it's not that often that you can have a dream come true at this point in your life or career. And so I'll just never forget picking up the paper for the first time and then seeing like that picture of, of me, you know, that, and it took a while for them, by the way, to kind of do that picture. Cause actually there is someone who like does that. And I was like, oh, that looks so cool. And so, um. That was a big moment for me. And then talking to Jim Murray's wife about it, and I was like, listen, my column's gonna run on this date. It was like February 17th or whatever. And she's like, oh my God, I have chills. And I said, why? And she said, that's the day Jim's column first ran. You know, and so. And you were the Jim Murray scholar. I was, and then just that moment meant so much. And that, really that my connection with her, um, and getting to write for the, the, the times, like that's, I mean, again, uh, uh, something that I never thought would happen, you know, because it, it was like, you know what, that was a great dream of mine when I was a kid, but listen, newspapers are not what they used to be and th things like that. But getting to go there now and then like, I do this thing every now and again, if I have a column, like I'll take a picture of like the actual newspaper and a cup of coffee or something. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, like the simplicity of that, I think is fantastic. And, and you talk about simplicity, but you look at potentially expanded roles beyond that as you get further into the times or, you know, you want to do more. Like, yeah. What do you kind of see the next stage of Arash's <laughs> career to, to look like beyond just, you know, columns? Yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed the ability to do TV and radio and podcasting and things like that. And so I've actually done more of that with the times, which is like surprising. I yeah. think when I left, people are like, oh, like, that's great that you you get to write, but like, are you still going to do TV and stuff like that? So the fact that I've been able to do more is kind of surprising, but I've loved it. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to do more in that space. I don't know whether it's to have my own show, for example, but something more where it's on a regular, um, you know, weekly, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a show. But like we touched on, you know, I could have a show on YouTube or Twitch or whatnot. And so um, I think that's the next journey uh, or the next step for me is to do something there. Um but we'll see. I mean, it, it, I have not even been at the Times for a year, but the opportunities I've had along the way have, have really surprised me. And does that come from the top? Um, no, you know, I, I just think it's, it's the opportunities that they have there in terms of, uh, of, of, what, of it being a great time in sports in Los Angeles. So when, you know, when the Clippers get Kawhi, like I get a call from like Colin Coward's show to kind of go on his show to kind of talk about that. Or, um, you know, Dodgers playoff, I'll go on like Channel 4 here. And, and so it really the ability to not just do one channel. Like I think with, you know, the, the thing with the Times is they want you to do that. So whether it's TV, whether it's podcasts or whatnot, they encourage you, which I think is great is there anything after the times i don't know yeah i mean i'm loving it right now so yeah. i mean i i don't um but the cool thing is like they don't prevent you from other um opportunities that you may have in the future so um i love it it's i mean i really and i know it's cliche to say it's been like a dream job it really has been a, a dream so um nothing in the future i would like to write a book you know about sort of like a lot of the stuff i've i've been through you know this you know losing 130 pounds in a year is a, is a potential subject you know surviving cancer twice is like another thing just I've, I've been through so much in my life that i think it'd be fun to write a book at some point but um i just have to find like maybe like the right time or time and place i don't know yeah and, and talk about that too it's i mean it's a pretty big part of your story overall is the overcoming the cancer yeah. the losing the weight i mean it's probably a lot of adversity perseverance times where you probably even felt that like i don't even know if this is for me yeah well the the weight loss thing i wasn't ever sure if it was going to happen because i i wanted to do it for so long but it was always one of those things where i would join Lindora or Weight Watchers or whatever. And I, I think I would do a good job for like a week or two, but then that, that would be it. And so to, to, to do this that consistently for a, a year and to lose that much weight in a year, I, I, I never thought it would happen. So there are mornings that I wake up and I look at myself and I'm like, damn, I can't believe I actually accomplished this. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. very happy I did. But there was a time and place where I'm like, I think I'm just going to be around this size. Um, but you know, the, the problem was, and, and the reason that I made the, the, the change was I was like, if, if this keeps continuing, you know, I, I don't know if I'll be around that much longer. You know what I'm saying? When you, when you're, when you are that big and you have trouble breathing and walking and sleeping and things like that, 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 that became a problem for me. And, you know, I mean, so many people that I loved uh, came up to me during that time and, and they said, listen, we, we, we love you. We, we want you to be here for a, a long time. Like, please take care of yourself. And I, and when people say that, like it, it hits home, but then I mean, as crazy as it sounds, like you just go get a pizza or a hamburger and you kind of like forget about that. And then sometimes you even get upset at them. Like if my mom was like, please take care of yourself. I'm like, listen, I don't want to hear that right now. I just yeah. want to live my life. And, and so they, they're happy to all those people, my family, friends are, are just like, man, like we've, we hoped and prayed that you would do this for a long time. You never did. And then when, now that you finally have done this, like, like they're so thrilled. And, and from the cancer standpoint too, I'm sure that was like even a testament to just the will early on, right? Twice, yeah. right? Like how did you at times feel like, I don't even know if I want to write or, or whatever yeah. it was. You probably felt like you probably just battled some other stuff beyond just that, right? Yeah. I mean, the second time it came back, I mean, that's when you're like, oh, really, I have to do this again. Like I have to go through that whole process again. And then, so that was hard for me. Um, and so I, I, I had it when I was 21 and 25. And so to have cancer that young and to be at the hospital and really, you know, not know if the treatment's going to work. I mean, I think that I, I was very, positive at that time and and i was like listen if i just do what they tell me to do it, it's 
will work, but you, you don't know. And so that was such a tough time for me because it, it made me appreciate life. I think, you know, we often are um, kind of live in the moment, but are like, oh, the depressed over a breakup or like a, a job that you lost or something like that. But like, this was like my life, you know, and, and, um, you know, it was, it was so hard for like my parents as well. Cause like, that's a helpless feeling. Like yeah. they want to help out, but the only thing that they can do is kind of like sit by my side as I'm getting treatment. So, um, that's another one where I always am open to talking to people who uh, are going through that or are young. I mean, I, I think in particular, if you're young and you are going through that, that is such a tough thing. Um, and the both times that I went through treatment was in the summer. So imagine you're 21, 25, it's the summer, you're in Los Angeles and you just want to have fun. And it's like, I'm in the hospital. And it was, um, Something I will never forget, and I always appreciate when I wake up and I don't have those symptoms. And it was, you know, it was like night sweat and like chest pains and things like that. So, like, I really appreciate um, every day I have because there were days like I wasn't sure if I was, you know, like, is the treatment going to work? I mean, like, I just remember like the nights praying after getting treatment. And then it's like you go to do a, a... a CT scan and it's like, okay, please let this work. Like that would be like the worst thing if all this treatment that I'm, that I'm receiving and then it's not working. So. And here you are <laughs> and, <laughs> here I am. and it's worked and you got 10 years of LA sports ahead of you. But you know, as, as you look and, and from a goal standpoint, what, what is that one thing that besides maybe the book that you may want to chase or that's the next thing on your list um you got the la times gig what's that what's that next goal what's the big picture goal and and maybe even outside of writing is there something that you want to potentially do long term that maybe it's a sandwich shop yeah (laughs) that that was a big goal of mine to get a food thing named after me the fact that they have a sandwich named after me is cool i would like to do something and if it's sports great if it's not but like we just touched on like a book screenplay movie type thing where it's you know something where it's i love to write but to, if if i were to able to have like an idea or a concept or whatever of something that became a book that turned into a screenplay that turned into a movie would be nice because i just you know th- that's something that i've always thought about and maybe at some point i should really s- sit down and actually try to hammer home like an idea but I think that would be cool to sit in a movie theater and that's a movie that I helped to write or I was based off of something that I wrote. And what's, at least from an LA standpoint, what's the team that's going to come out at the next, over the next decade, what's going to be the best team? And what do you think factors into to who that comes out to be? The best team in terms of like they're, they're going to win championships or whatever or, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the Lakers are the brand that, like, no matter what they do, are going to be, like, the heart and soul of Los Angeles, I think. And I think, by the way, the city really proved that by supporting them over the past six years. I mean, they had, for six years, they had the worst percentage in the league. Like, them and the Knicks were tied as the two worst teams over the past uh, six years. And the, and the fans were still there. They supported them. They sold out games. So now that they have two of the top five players. And now that they are a championship contender, I think they are one of those teams that I think will always rate well, draw well. Um, so that that'll be interesting. Um, I am very, like we touched on, very interested. If the Clippers continue with this sustained success, and certainly if they win a, a championship, how does that change their dynamic here? Because right now, if you're a Lakers fan, you really don't like the Clippers, and your response on Twitter, if I tweet about the Clippers, is like, move them to Seattle, which is always like hilarious to me. I'm like, they've been here for so long. Why? Yeah. Um, how does a new arena, how does a championship, how does sustained success change them? And then I guess through it all, right, you've, you've had the ups and downs, plenty of them, right? And lots of ups, lots of downs. What is something that you've kind of looked to? I wouldn't say it's like a guiding light from an advice standpoint, but just maybe even like a mentorship standpoint or something that's like stuck with you throughout, you know, what this first 15 years post-college journey has been like. Yeah. You know, I mean, it really was shaped by the cancer uh, treatment that, that I got and being in the hospital and just really 
appreciating the moments that that I did have because if if you are put in a situation where you don't know if you're going to make it or you know let's see how treatment goes it, it could work it could not and and so to to have that perspective and I and I, so to have those moments happen to me at 21 and 25 were were, were big because even now I never forget that perspective. And so when there have been times where work is hard or things don't go my way, like just having that, that perspective of like, listen, like there's worse things that can happen. And so that is always sort of, you know, there's a lot of times people wonder like, oh, well, why are you so happy all the time? Or why do you always <laughs> smile or laugh or whatever? Yeah. I'm like, I, the fact that I'm living, the fact that I'm here, the fact that I'm, I get to do what I do. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, I'm so happy. So, yeah. like, you know, people are like, well, that's not like a low bar. I'm like, no, like <laughs> I, I woke up this morning. I mean, and I, and I get to do my dream job, you know. And that's what you can ask exactly. for at the end of the day. 